This week, a special report from Dr. Helen Caldicott's Symposium on the Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction, which was held this past weekend, February 28th and 1st, at the New York Academy of Medicine in Manhattan. There will be a rundown of speakers as well as side interviews with some of the presenters, activists, volunteers, and audience members who attended. And two surprises, as I discovered a shocking, unreported story straight out of Fukushima and got briefed on some recent surprises at one of the most dangerous nuclear reactors in the country. Today is Thursday, March 5th, 2015, and here is a very truncated version of the week's anti-nuclear news. First, a big win and huge congratulations to our compatriots in northern Saskatchewan for having gotten rid of the nuclear waste dump that was planned for that area. Nuclear Waste Management Organization may say that new geological studies in the vicinity of Creighton, Saskatchewan, were responsible for nixing the idea there. Everyone knows that a well-organized opposition developed against a nuclear fuel repository that was headed by First Nations activists. In addition to the Committee for Future Generations and the Coalition for a Clean Green Saskatchewan, our thanks and shout-out go to Susnige Nene, Candice Paul, and all of you who worked so hard for so long on this issue to protect the Earth. Aho, matakwiasen, yiha, and from my tribe to yours, mazel tov. In Japan, a court has ordered a group of anti-nuclear activists to remove their tents from the premises of the Economy, Trade, and Industry Ministry and to pay for using the site. The tents have served as a symbol of Japan's anti-nuclear movements since they were set up three and a half years ago. Beginning six months after the March 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster began, The group set up tents at a corner of the ministry's premises in Tokyo. The ministry oversees the country's nuclear power industry. The government said the group is illegally occupying state-owned property and demanded that the leaders pay more than 20,000 yen, or about $177 a day, for the period from the day the tents were pitched until their removal is complete. The amount is estimated to be approximately $240,000 at present. The reason for the removal is that the tents have blocked information boards of the ministry, causing inconvenience to visitors. Nah, it's part of the run-up to the 2020 Radioactive Olympics in Tokyo, and everyone knows it. Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's on a week. No one ever accused British royalty of being bright, but Prince William has taken the dim bulb rating down even further by allowing himself to be played by Japanese nuclear interests. Old Princey, who's looking less stubbly and more like his dad all the time, toured Japan for seven days, and wouldn't you know it, he went up to Fukushima to visit the local hot spots and chow down on some good old locally grown food. Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. Even before Prince William arrived in the country, victims of the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster accused him of being a stooge to Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe baby in order to promote his pro-nuclear policies. But hey, the British royal family is heavily invested in nukes, and Princey has already produced an heir with a spare baking in Kate's oven. So what the heck, why not risk his DNA? And while he's at it, visit a playground to see children who are statistically likely to have compromised thyroids because of radiation exposure. Nothing is too much to create the illusion that all in Fukushima is A-OK. Of course, the number two heir to the throne of England and host Abe Baby will drive right past a village where some of the 80,000 people driven out of their homes in the exclusion zone around the radioactive wreck of that power plant still live as refugees. But there's no need to get messy about it with some of the ugly truth. So, Will, while you're there, why don't you put it in order to buy some eco-cement, manufactured with Fukushima ash and good for making repairs on Buckingham Palace. It is rumored to glow in the dark for at least a half-life of 24,000 years, and that will make it brighter than you. And that's why you, Prince William, are this week's Nuclear hot seat, none that's on a week.
And now, this week's special report. Dr. Helen Caldicott's Symposium on the Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction was a massive event. Bringing together two dozen experts in various aspects of nuclear weaponry and the battle against it, to share their expertise both with the attending audience and those who witnessed the program on live stream. The information proved staggering, perspective shattering, and potentially life changing in its power and clarity. The two day gathering, which took place February 28th and March 1st at the New York Academy of Medicine, was live streamed, and the video recordings are now up at TotalWebcasting.com slash live slash HCF, which stands for Helen Caldicott Foundation. We will, of course, have a link up on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, under this episode, number 183. Because the complete symposium is available for you to view whenever and as often as you like, the report that follows, for the most part, mentions the speakers and their topics, but it is more about what happened around the edges of the symposium, the conversations in the lobby, the thoughts of the activists who attended, direct messages from a few of the speakers, and new information on stories that Nuclear Hot Seat has been covering, including one that we are breaking here for the first time. We'll start with the scoop which is how the entire event started for me before I even got my seat or a cup of coffee. I never suspected what I would learn about graft and greed in Japan when I asked a volunteer where she came from and why she was at the symposium. Rachel Clark explains. My name is Rachel Clark. I'm an independent freelance interpreter. Uh, since uh, 2010 NPT Review Conference, uh, I've been dealing with the uh, nuclear issues. And recently, I've been following the uh, issue what's happened in Fukushima, as well as military issues in Okinawa, Japan. And uh, last year, I was given the opportunity to be uh, the interpreter for Nago City Mayor from Okinawa when he visited New York and Washington, D.C. And through this experience, as well as my study uh, since 2010, I came to the conclusion there's a very uh, strong link between Fukushima and Okinawa. And let me explain why and how it happened. It's been a very big issue in Japan how to deal with the uh, radioactive rubble as well as ever mounting soil after decontamination efforts. You know, after precipitation, no matter how often they do decontamination, the irradiated soil has been mounting, mounting, it almost like a pyramid of a blue big plastic bags. And those bags are supposed to last only, you know, for three years or so. So earlier versions are already uh, breaking down and uh, you can see uh, the trees are com coming from the those bags. So what happened was Japanese government spread the rubbles all over Japan to a huge uh, incinerating facilities to have them incinerate. Then, uh, after that, there's a, a company called JESCO. This is also a part of um, government-affiliated private companies. They are originally uh, established in order to deal with the PCB. But at those facilities now, they are burning irradiated soil from affected area. By incinerating uh, rubbles and irradiating soil, as well as the sludge from sewage, the radiation level goes as high as 20 times more. And, uh, of course, the capacity gets smaller. And what do they do with the ash after incinerating them? Well, there's a company, the major cement companies called Taiheyo, which means Pacific, Pacific Cement and Aso Cement. This Aso Cement, by the way, owned by Deputy Prime Minister Aso. And the two more companies, all oh, those four companies co-own patent of a product called Eco Cement. Eco Cement is a kind of special cement that they mix incinerated ash into it. Okay, and in the recent past, four Japanese government ministries, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Reconstruction of Affected Area, Ministry of Industry and Trading, and one more, I forgot, but the four ministries came together, announced a special dealing about eco-cement, which is that if those big construction companies, if they want to bid into public construction projects, 
they have to use eco cement. Well, maybe that expression is too strong, but if they use eco cement, their point goes up. That means the chance of probability to get the job is higher. So, flip side of this announcement is if they do not use eco cement, they don't have chance to get the job. So, if you think about the Japanese、uh, future projects, they are expecting to have a 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. They already started construction of a maglev train between Tokyo and Nagoya. By the way, between Tokyo and Nagoya, 80% of this routing is in the mountain. So they have to dig holes big time, so they have a lot of soil to deal with. And thirdly, now it's a big issue in Okinawa. Futema Air Base needs to be relocated. And Henoko in Nago City is a, a planned site for this relocation of the air base. To which they required a huge quantity of、uh, landfill. Those big major public construction requires a lot of concrete in order to you know, make those concrete. Of course, they have to use a huge amount of cement. So, my concern is so far, Okinawa is the only prefecture not being affected by radiation. But if they start using those eco cement to make this landfill and all the facility for the new base, The Okinawa Island also will be irradiated, as well as the rest of Japan. So we have to stop it. That was Rachel Clark, who volunteered at Dr. Caldicott's symposium. As a result of our brief talk, Rachel has since been put in touch with other activists who are working on the Fukushima decontamination materials incineration issue. Many well known activists attended, including Beyond Nuclear's Cindy Fokers. Who explains why she made the trip up from Washington, D.C. to attend the two day event? I'm Cindy Folkers. I'm with Beyond Nuclear, their radiation and health specialist. And I'm here at the conference because I think it's important to understand the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons, and that even lower doses of radiation can cause harm. And I wanted to be here to see what specifically the health Concerns were after nuclear bombs and how many generations the concerns last and the health effects last. And I also think that it's important to understand the connections because with nuclear power and nuclear weapons, if you have a military industrial complex behind one, then they're going to be behind the other. So the military gives money for nuclear weapons and They need the nuclear power part to convince people that there is a safe side to this technology when, in point of fact, there is not. And we've seen that after Chernobyl and we've seen that after Fukushima, that the nuclear dragon can come back and bite you no matter which form it's actually in. Cindy Folkers. As the symposium began, Dr. Caldicott addressed us first. Welcoming us in a way that basically let us know to fasten our seatbelts because it was going to be one hell of a two day bumpy ride into full awareness on nuclear weapons issues. Among the many points she made was regarding Ukraine, of which she said, We cannot make war on a country with 15 large nuclear reactors like Chernobyl because it will turn into a nuclear war. It's easy to melt them down. So, if you've ever wondered about the connection between nuclear reactors, which is the usual focus of this program, and nuclear weapons, which seems like it's going to be an ongoing focus of this program, you just heard one example. The first speaker was Theodore Postel, Professor Emeritus of Science, Technology, and National Security at MIT. He focused on the fragility of Russia's early warning system and the danger it presents to the United States. He also unmasked the lie of funding research and development into improved weapons accuracy as having negligible impact, calling the funding, quote, insane and disconnected from any practical reality. I caught up with him after his speech and had him share with us his final concepts. Professor Theodore Postel. The fact of the matter is that it is completely impossible to fight and win a nuclear war. Because the effects of nuclear weapons are so large and so indiscriminate that the only possible outcome would be indistinguishable from attacks aimed at killing as many people as possible. Yet, U.S. 
nuclear war planning treats this totally fraudulent theory of war as if it is the goal of U.S. forces. So this brings us back to the question of deterrence. If the only realistic hope of deterring potential adversaries is by threatening them with physical and socially mortal consequences of reprisal, then although this option may be very uncomfortable, it's all that we have. Striving to be able to do more only creates the appearance that you think you can fight and win a war against a potential adversary, in this case, Russia. The net result is that the Russians have no choice but to wonder what the United States might do in a crisis. The Russians have a substantial fraction of vulnerable nuclear forces, and they do not have the early warning capability to assure themselves that these forces are not being attacked. This is not a situation that should make anybody in this room comfortable. It increases the chances that a horror beyond existential experience could result from simple human error. The idea that by continuing to raise the level of threat against Russia via the kinds of improvements that are now being implemented in the U.S. nuclear force modernization program might well be counted as possibly the most dangerous insanity in human history. Theodore Postal. But all was not so serious with Ted. I asked him during a break if he knew any nuclear humor. Here's what he shared. Nuclear weapons are really great, except for two small problems. One is they're so destructive that they get everything. And two is the other guy's got them, too. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing the things you will laugh at at a conference like this. Max Tegmark is a professor of physics at MIT who specializes in artificial intelligence. And he made us aware that within 20 years, it will be possible for computers to trigger a nuclear war without any human input. Whee! <laughs> what fun. He did speak with some wit about problems with the hydrogen bomb, which he labeled a spectacular thermonuclear, unpredictable population incineration device or to use the acronym, STUPID. You've got to see the visuals that he uses during his talk to understand the full impact of that acronym. Then Alan Robach talk. Alan is one of the only major climate change scientists who will speak out about nuclear's potential impact on the biosphere. He is a distinguished professor of the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers University. And his topic was nuclear famine and nuclear winter. Climatic Effects of Nuclear War, Catastrophic Threats to the Global Food Supply. While it is a very bad joke that the cure to global warming is nuclear winter, Robach explained exactly how bad that concept is, and in terms that you will not be able to forget. Despite the fact that this symposium was about weapons, the information pool in the room was extraordinary. I wish there could have been a means or a mechanism so that we could identify and find each other to have even more side conversations. But in one side conversation, I caught up with Diane Turco, who is down from Massachusetts for the event, and who has been an ongoing source to nuclear hot seat on the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant. She excitedly shared this latest story about that flawed, dangerous reactor. I'm Diane Turco. I live in Harwich, Massachusetts on lovely Cape Cod, and I am with Cape Downwinders. I'm here because Dr. Caldecott has been just such a powerful influence around the world and has really educated us all on the dangers of nuclear weapons and nuclear power. And she's come to the Cape quite a few times to support our efforts to get Pilgrim Nuclear Power Reactor closed. Pilgrim is right on Cape Cod Bay, and it's in its 42nd year of operation. I understand that just recently you actually were able to close Pilgrim. Talk to me about that. We know that um, from a recent NRC report that Pilgrim has not implemented its corrective action plan from 2013 when it was one of the worst operating reactors in the country. And for a whole year, the NRC increased their oversight on Pilgrim. Well, guess what? We had a winter storm on January 27th of this year. And before that storm, a whole coalition of groups said, shut it down. There's going to be a scram, just like in 2013, and that's exactly what happened. Entergy continued to operate the reactor throughout that storm, and there was an emergency scram, which entailed failure of backup emergency equipment. 
We knew that was going to happen. This Pilgrim nuclear reactor operated by Entergy Corporation is failing infrastructure, and it's documented by the NRC. So it was closed for a whole week. The NRC spent a, sent a special inspection team down. That's a serious issue when the NRC immediately sends an inspection team down. So it went back online a week later, and a subsequent storm was coming the next weekend. And so we said again, shut it down. Well, we had said keep it shut. We made a plea, keep it shut when it was shut after the first storm. Well, they went restarted for a few days. A new storm came up, and Entergy decided to quote, voluntarily shut down the reactor. But what we see this as, as an indication that Entergy Corporation knows that Pilgrim Nuclear Power Reactor on Cape Cod Bay will not survive a storm. It will scram, and that's a, an imminent threat to all of us. It can scram any time without a storm. And I understand that it has not restarted since that storm. After the, quote, voluntary shutdown of Pilgrim, Entergy experienced continual problems at the reactor. What happened, the main condenser tube, there were main condenser tube leaks, there was an electrical breaker problem, and a power supply problem. They didn't restart for another week after the voluntary shutdown, which again is evidence of the failing infrastructure. So we have Pilgrim Nuclear Power, which is a failed design with failing infrastructure, regulated by a failing Nuclear Regulatory Commission because it's not protecting the public. It needs to be kept shut. So we asked David Lockbaum from the Union of Concerned Scientists, what does this all mean? The NRC said, well, there were no safety pieces of equipment involved in this latest problem. And uh, David Lockbaum said he was really concerned with the dismissal of these issues because of non-safety equipment systems. He said, and this is quote, the March 1979 meltdown of Three Mile Island Unit 2 reactor was triggered by the failure of non-safety related components. The April 1986 accident at Chernobyl Unit 4 was triggered by a badly conducted test of a non-safety related component. When a non-safety related component caused two of the worst nuclear plant accidents in recorded history, it's hard to dismiss non-safety related component problems so cavalierly. So the NRC is saying, don't worry, it was non-safety related equipment problems, when in fact those were the initiators of two of the worst nuclear accidents the world has seen. Is it in operation now? It's a crime against humanity that that is operating right on Cape Cod Bay today, yes. Diane Turco of Cape Cod Downwinders. The morning sessions resumed with Stephen Starr, an associate of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and former board member and senior scientist for Physicians for Social Responsibility. Despite a bad cold, he spoke movingly with great clarity on nuclear war, an unrecognized mass extinction event waiting to happen. He shared with us the difficulty of making these issues known, as nothing is taught in public schools about nuclear, and most people have no awareness of the genuine dangers involved with the use of these weapons. Afterwards, I asked him what any of us can do. When you said at the end that I think we can change things, I was wondering if you could say a thought or two about how we might be able to get started on that. What could be done within the community or in an organizing sense or as a focal sense to start dismantling the military-industrial complex? I think people need to be aware that, like Bruce was saying, that uh, military hardware is our primary industrial product right now. You know, we've lost our industrial base. We don't make the basic things that we used to. And so when we make weapons for most of our livings, or you know, it's such a big percentage, I think that... Um, that drives a lot of the war process. You know, we have we've had a war every year in the 21st century, and people are almost desensitized to it. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not really newsworthy anymore. They hire mercenary armies to fight it too, so we don't have the draft. But I think people need first of all to, to get more in touch with the fact that we're fighting wars. That we need we need to stop this. We don't need any more wars. We need to resist. For example, the idea that we should start sending billions of dollars of weapons to Ukraine. And that's particularly important because, it, you know, Russia's involved. So that touches on what's going on today because Russia is not, as some of the people, even President Obama would call them a regional power. Well, if you've got 8,000 nuclear weapons, you're not a regional power. I think locally, you know, first you've got to talk to people. You've got to get a little bit organized. You've got to establish some kind of communication because you can't just 
do this by yourself. So it's a good, I think, it's a good idea to join an organization if you can identify one that may be regional or national, and then set up a chapter where you live and get people and go into their houses and do presentations, <clears throat> make go to alternative sources on the internet, and make posts. But you have to educate yourself. That's one of the problems. Is like I talked about today, we have no educational process in the United States about nuclear weapons. It's not taught in public schools. So when I get try to give a talk, I have a hell of a time just because I got to spend 15 or 20 minutes explaining the very basic facts before I can, you know, people have to understand that weapons exist. It's hard to give a presentation like this, and then I have people go, "Oh God, why even, why even bother?" You know? But I don't think that should be the case. I want people to at least understand that, that they are personally threatened by this. It's important for them to take some kind of action. And they actually can be anything that they're inspired by, really, because you do you know, if you find somebody you can connect with, whether it's an organization or take some activity, a little bit of time. Because if you don't do something, it's like there's got to be a moment in your life sometimes where you think, yeah, you know, I got to do something about this. I was hoping that maybe somebody listening to my talk today might think, God, I got to do something. <laughs> well, if there was a simple path, then it'd be obvious to everybody what it was to take. I do think, I, maybe I'm naive, but it's like the Mr. Smith goes to Washington thing where I still believe that Americans here are basically good people. They, and we've been brought up with these democratic ideals and the value in, in the individual and life. Well, we have to apply that to what's going on. We can't just think we're the indispensable people and nobody else counts and we can fight wars everywhere. But mostly, you know, nuclear weapons, that may be the tip of the iceberg, but it is the one thing that can kill us in just a matter of an hour or so. So I recommend people get involved in some aspect of this to try to do something. Stephen Starr. Before the symposium, I was unaware of the next speaker, Bruce Gagnon. But he became a real hero of mine when I learned how he embodies the 60s ideal of living a simple life surrounded by nature and doing good work for people and the planet. He is not only a highly effective activist against nuclear weapons, he lives a modest, close-to-the-land life in the woods in Maine, where he heads up the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Bruce scaled his presentation on the militarization of space nuclear war so that you didn't have to be a scientist or a policy wonk to understand exactly what he was saying and what we face. He did say that countries like the United States are addicted to military spending, tracing this wrong-minded use of tax dollars back to the Civil War and Crazy Horse which is where the disinformation and propaganda all began. We will have Bruce Gagnon on an upcoming nuclear hot seat to discuss this subject in depth, but here's what he had to say to listeners after he spoke from the stage. I think the most important thing is to take back our own minds, what I call decolonize our minds. That's where we have to start because our minds have been filled with garbage for our whole lives by the corporate media, by the school system, and everything else. So that's the first process because you can't really move into any kind of action. You can't really have a plan to change anything until you really know in your heart what the truth is. And the truth is so clouded by all the uh, the uh, indoctrination and uh, mind washing that we get. So I think that's the most important thing is to begin to decolonize your own mind and take back your own truth. And then you have to follow your heart. You know, the Native Americans said, don't be afraid, dive into the river, let the current take you where it will. And I think that's the, really the answer. It's that simple. It's just trust your heart, follow your heart, follow your calling that leads you to uh, whatever particular issue it may be and then give it everything you have and then in the end you have to let go of the results because none of us are all so powerful that we can change the world on our own but we, if we each do our bit, if we each do what we can do, when you add all that up it's one hell of a magical formula around the world of action and, and things can begin to move. And so if we just really are strong 
uh, strongly determined about doing what we can do, doing what we feel passionate about, then that really is a huge contribution to global activity. Bruce Gagnon. Bill Hartung of the Center for International Policy broke down the inordinate power and pathology dynamics of the U.S. military industrial complex, and then, quite thankfully, we took a break. That's when I caught up with Alice Slater of the New Age Peace Foundation, who had this to share, including an effective new campaign on how to start pulling the plug on nuclear weapons. Well, we're in a crisis. We're in a turning point in the world. I mean, we're starting World War III with Russia over Ukraine, and Helen Caldicott is wonderful to come and start organizing for us to be thinking about the next steps. And I think the speakers are wonderful that she had. Some of them had some very interesting perspectives. I love the guy that spoke on artificial intelligence and his stupid project, you know. And uh, and I was very pleased to hear um, the doctor who talked about nuclear winter explain about ICANN, I Can Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which is a fabulous new campaign where they're saying forget about the nuclear weapon states. We're going to start without them and get a treaty to say nuclear weapons should be banned, just like we banned chemical weapons and biological weapons, and we haven't done that for nuclear weapons. We ban landmines, and there's no speaking about it in the United States right now, so I'm glad that this is going to be kind of a launch, and you'll be hearing from other speakers about ICANN, ICANNW.org, ICAN, uh, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which is like a new way to come at it, because if the U.S. and the Rus Russia are going to be so stubborn and not do anything, let the whole rest of the world say they're illegal. And that can pull out some of the allies that are hiding under the U.S. nuclear umbrella, like the NATO states that have a nuclear policy, like the three country, five countries in Europe that have U.S. nuclear weapons on their soil. Germany, Netherlands, Turkey, Italy, and Spain have nuclear weapons, U.S. nuclear weapons. That would, like, get them to start to break loose if or everybody starts saying they're illegal. And we just got a statement from the uh, Latin American Caribbean Alliance, 33 countries, saying they're going to support the ban treaty. This is coming out of this international humanitarian initiative that started with Oslo, then it went to Mexico, and we just met in Vienna last year. Austria gave a pledge at this meeting in Vienna this past December that they were going to get a document and get countries to sign the pledge to fill in the legal gap on nuclear weapons because there's no law that says they're banned. So this is very exciting, and I'm glad it's come up, and it will come up for the rest of the conference again. Alice Slater. As the symposium resumed, Greg Mello of the Los Alamos Study Group pointed out that we the people accept a level of violence as normal that most definitely is not, and that this acceptance of violence is a block to taking positive action. He revealed that at the Department of Energy, there are two lobbyists on payroll for every worker, making it the most privatized of all government agencies, and that nuclear weapons are the most privatized of all meaning the industrial part of the military-industrial complex, controls our weapons decisions, and in his words, lying is built into the system. Many profound insights were shared with great clarity by Greg Mello. Seth Baum of the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute spoke on the catastrophic risk of nuclear war and went into more specifics about exactly how on edge we are. He also highlighted the international campaign to abolish nuclear war that Alice Slater spoke of and which you can check out at ICANN.org. Bob Alvarez, well known to those of us in the anti-nuclear movement, went into specifics on the situation in Ukraine as part of his talk, Lateral Proliferation Could Trigger a Nuclear Holocaust, in a presentation filled with clear, jaw-dropping concepts. The one that hit me as the most numbnuts is that the Department of Energy spends 30% of its budget on nuclear weapons and that two-thirds of its entire budget goes to nuclear, something which Bob labeled plutonium gate. 
Given the seriousness of his subject, of course, when I had the chance to speak with him, I asked for some nuclear humor, and he delivered. Several years ago, uh, I attended a congressional hearing regarding a experimental reactor called the Liquid Metal Fast Peter Reactor Program, uh, which was a, a big deal by the Atomic Energy Commission in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. It was before a Senate panel, and they were asking the witness, who was then from the uh, then the Atomic Energy Commission, now the Energy Department, what would happen if they lost the coolant for the reactor? And his reply was that he thought they would have a rapid energetic disassembly. <laughs> and that it didn't pass the laugh test with the senators. He said, you mean to say explosion? And he said, well, it would be more like a rapid quite high energy disassembly, uh, you know, these are different concepts. <laughs> <laughs> the languaging trolls. Bob Alvarez. Investigative journalist Robert Perry gave a chilling rundown on how we're being propagandized about Ukraine and how it's really a proxy for a U.S.-Russian war. If you want to know what's genuinely happening over in Ukraine and how to start interpreting the skewed information flow we're receiving, I urge you to listen to this presentation. I asked Robert about the historical backdrop to media manipulation that includes manipulation of our understanding of nuclear. When the, the American people turned against the Vietnam War back in the 70s, that was a real blow to some of the people in the government and in the industry that wanted to make war more of a, uh, a bigger deal, something they could continue doing. So there was an effort in the 80s to get control of that and get the American people back on board with uh, supporting military uh, adventures around the world and supporting the whole military industrial complex, having more weapons, having more even nuclear. So there was this idea that if the government could both manage the American press corps to get it to be more supportive of these kinds of efforts and through them, the American people, to get them more supportive and various techniques were used, propaganda techniques like demonizing enemies and so forth, that that's sort of the way that we moved from the Vietnam War period, the Viet, what was called the Vietnam Syndrome, to moving on toward the Persian Gulf War, say, in, in 91. And at the end of the Persian Gulf War, after that 100-hour bloodbath that occurred, the first thing that George H.W. Bush said, he went down and said, we've kicked the Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. And explain exactly what you mean by the Vietnam Syndrome. The Vietnam Syndrome was the hesitancy of the American people to take part in these foreign adventures, these wars. That they were sick and tired of uh, the violence, they were sick and tired of uh, body bags coming back, they were sick and tired of the expense, the lies that they were hearing from the government. All that is sort of the Vietnam Syndrome. So the government had to figure out how do you break that, break that down, and get the American people back on board. And by 91, with the excitement about the Persian Gulf War, which was seen as a quick, easy conflict, although it has had repercussions that have been quite deadly going forward, but then it was considered a very neat, clean victory. Very few Americans died. A lot of Iraqis died. And it was a victory. So people were very happy and excited. And that sort of brought them back into the support of this kind of more militaristic approach to the world. How do you see that as impacting on the whole nuclear issue? Clearly it's part of it, because the, the idea of being very strong, having America's uh, strategic defenses being fully funded, all that goes to this idea that the Americans are facing dangerous enemies abroad. They have to have the, the weaponry to deter them. And, it, and by getting the American people, at least to a great to a significant amount, in support of that, then the politicians can go ahead and pass these appropriation bills to fund the nuclear programs, too. Investigative journalist Robert Perry. Then we moved on to the evening's lighthearted entertainment, the 1959 original movie On the Beach, about nuclear extinction as seen through the eyes of Gregory Peck, Ava Gardner, Fred Astaire, and Tony Perkins. While we all had extreme respect for Dr. Caldecott's desire to underscore the emotions connected with this subject, both Bob Alvarez and I agreed that this would have been a perfect time for Dr. Strangelove, and possibly some alcohol as well. Well, that's what Video On Demand is for. You can also find On The Beach for free on YouTube. Day two started with what I found to be the most emotionally impactful presentation of the two days. 
Holly Barker is with the Department of Anthropology at the University of Washington. She spoke about the Marshall Islanders, who were used as human guinea pigs in an ongoing study of the impact of radiation on human beings. Hers is an ugly, heartbreaking story of how the U.S. acted like Nazis did with their inhuman human experiments. The Marshall Islanders were exposed to the equivalent of 1.6 Hiroshima bombs worth of radiation every day for 12 years. I encourage you to listen to Holly Barker's brilliant presentation and know that I will also be interviewing her for a future nuclear hot seat. Four sessions followed on the world's nuclear arsenals, nuclear spending, the history of what is labeled arms control, which is an oxymoron from the morons who like things that go boom and bang, and how the U.S. government and corporations that make nukes have virtually merged, making it almost impossible to get people involved with these industries to turn against the powers that are responsible for providing their salaries. But there were many rays of hope in the day's presentations. Susie Snyder from PAX, the Netherlands, provided a big one, a strategy for taking funding away from companies that make nuclear bombs and delivery components. Here she is with the short version of that strategy, which has implications for nuclear reactors as well. It's amazing. It's called Don't Bank on the Bomb. And that's the website, too, don'tbankonthebomb.com. Step one, find out if your bank invests in nuclear weapon producers. Step two, contact your bank. Tell them you don't want them to. Step three, tell the world what the bank says. And if they don't get rid of investments, go public. Because no bank wants to look like a bad guy. It takes one or two people only to make a huge difference. And that can cut off the money stream to the companies that make nuclear weapons. You and I, we have more power than we think, and that power is sitting in our wallet. And how can people find out whether the companies that we're told the bank is supporting have any connection with the nuclear weapons industry? Well, we do a, a significant investigation every year. Now, it's not completely exhaustive, but we profile 28 companies that have association with nuclear weapons modernization and maintenance. And it's on our website, don'tbankonthebomb.com. And we really want people to use our information and contact us all the time. You can do that in, you know, through the website really easily. Easily, contact me on Twitter, whatever works, and I'm happy to find out more. And if you find out, learn about more companies involved in nuclear weapons, tell us. We'll do the research, and we'll make it public for everybody to use. Love it. Susie Snyder of Don'tBankOnTheBomb.com. She pointed out that Blue Cross and Blue Shield are invested in nuclear weapons manufacturers. This is either a conflict of interest or a great marketing plan. Either way, time to let your banks know. This is a strategy that has been proven to work, and future generations will thank you as long as they have the opportunity to be born. Alex Wellerstein is an assistant professor of science and technology studies at the Stevens Institute of Technology, and he brought to our attention a tool he created to help younger generations understand the impact of nuclear weapons. It's a website with a program called Nuke Map. You put in your zip code, select a bomb from the list of all of them that have been detonated. You can sort by chronology, size, type, the year exploded. You push a button, et voila. You get to see what a nuclear blast over your home would look like. No, really look like, like a mushroom cloud. You can also see maps about how far its impact would reach and what the nature of that impact would be. The mushroom cloud is visible from a number of angles, including Google Maps. What fun! You can put in parameters to learn the number of people killed and injured, the height of the cloud. Now, the genius bit is that there's no commentary pro or con weapons on the site. Just the information and the chance to see what a nuclear bomb would actually do to the area immediately around you should it be detonated. This is especially good for the young people in our lives who don't learn anything about the impact of nuclear weapons and who also think this kind of stuff on computers is cool. To find it, go to nuclearsecrecy.com slash nuke map or just Google nuke map, one word. 
There's also a 3D model at NukeMap 3D. For those of us who work on nuclear reactor issues, know that Alex Wellerstein has said he would be happy to help someone or some group make a comparable mapping system for reactors. This could be a huge step up from the how close do I live to a nuclear reactor site put together a while back by money.cnn.com. We will have a link to Alex up on the website under this episode, number 193. The next speaker presented information of special interest to West Coast activists who are fighting Lawrence Livermore Labs. Hugh Gusterson is a professor of anthropology and international affairs at George Washington University. As an anthropologist, he's been studying the culture of nuclear weapons scientists at Livermore and Los Alamos. The one observation he made that I've heard touched upon, yet never heard made as clear and obvious as it now seems, is the racist nature of the use and abuse of nuclear weapons and materials. Bomb tests decimated Marshall Islanders, uranium mining on Native American tribal lands, the attempts of the Canadian government to build nuclear dumps on First Nations sacred lands, even the fact that the two bombs used in war were dropped upon the Japanese. It does appear to be a pattern, perhaps an unconscious one, but there, or a set of assumptions as to who is seen as expendable. Listen to Hugh Gusterson's full talk to get the impact of his points, as well as a psychological examination of what goes into the creation of a good nuke weapons researcher. There followed the conference's two headline heavy hitters, award-winning investigative journalist Robert Shear and Noam Chomsky, best described as a national treasure, who is a philosopher, logician, and the father of linguistics. The two sounded the gravest alarms of the conference on what they called the madness and pathology of the nuclear powers and those who have their finger on the button. I am not going to attempt to summarize these two titans, just urge you to listen for yourself. After our final break, and trust me, by then most of us were pretty nuked out, we did hear of possibility and hope from the three final speakers. David Krieger, president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, reminded us that the day he spoke, March 1st, was the 61st anniversary of the Bravo bomb dropping on Bikini Atoll, the largest bomb ever exploded by the United States. He told us about the lawsuit brought by the Marshall Islanders, a nation of only 70,000 people, against the nine nuclear nations, the U.S., Russia, China, Britain, France, Israel, India, Pakistan, and North Korea. The Marshall Islands is the only country to have taken action in this way, not asking for compensation for the heinous treatment they received at the hands of the United States nuclear policy, but for the International Court of Justice to force the nuclear nations to abide by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT. Again. The thought of the bravery of these much-abused people moved me deeply, and there is a petition you can sign in support of their case at nuclearzero.org. Tim Wright of ICANN.org, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons that has been mentioned several times during this program, spelled out the activities of this young, energetic group which has been working to get all non-nuclear nations together to force the nuclear bomb-capable nations to reduce their arsenals. In only three years, ICANN has over 140 nations signing on to their agreement, and they are still working to land more. This young Australian's energy and conviction conveyed a tremendous amount of hope for the future of the nuclear abolition movement which led us back to where all roads for this amazing event began, Dr. Helen Caldicott. She has always maintained that nuclear is not a political issue, but a medical one. Her closing comments were entitled, Where There's Life, There's Hope, and she brought us all in for a landing. Here is Dr. Caldicott in the final moments of her talk. 
The only person you can change is yourself. You can influence nobody else, but you can change yourself. You can educate yourself, and you've been well educated these last two days. Go through the grief, if you have it, of shock and disbelief, which I'm sure some of you are feeling, and grief and, and depression. Let yourself be depressed. Let yourself go through the feeling, because the next phase is anger. And anger, when focused in a white hot beam, is extraordinarily important. That's why we have an adrenal medulla that pumps out adrenaline when we're chased by a bull. It's fight or flight. And we can use our anger, which gives us tremendous power, to do the right thing. And if a door is closed in front of you, you go in the back door. You always go to the top. I used to go and see Tip O'Neill on the house floor. So what I'm saying is, if you change, and go through grief, and you will then, you'll know what to do. You know, there are people who are publishers, who are writers, and all sorts of things. You've got special talents. You will know what to do. And if you speak your truth, and you do what you are impelled to do, you will become a leader, because people like that. So often people say, you're so courageous. I'm not courageous. I'm just a doctor telling the truth. Doctors have to tell the truth, which is very unpleasant often, to their patients and help them through their grief. So I'm not courageous at all. There's a sense of conformity in this society. Everyone has straight teeth. When I go to Germany, I get a bit shocked because they all have pretty crooked teeth. Um, everyone says, have a nice day, and I don't even want to have a nice day, let alone be told to have a nice day, or thank you for calling AT&T when I didn't want to call AT&T in the first place. So conformity is death, eccentricity is life, and the spice of a society. And you can become an eccentric by becoming who you really are and what you are born to do. We were born, this generation, we were born to save the creation that's taken billions and billions and billions and billions of years to evolve. That's why we're here. You can be as, the most, as powerful as the most powerful person who ever lived. And I've kind of done that. If I can do it, I'm an alien, a woman, just a doctor. You can do it too. So there are enough people right here or who are listening, if they decide within their own soul and go through the stages I've just described, will save the planet. And fundamentally it boils down to love. If I tell parents their child has leukemia, they will sell their house, they will go to the Mayo Clinic, they will do whatever it takes to save that beloved child's life. And if the child dies, they'll never recover. So I would say, how much do you love your children? How much do you love your grandchildren? How much do you love the lilacs when they flower in the spring and the wisteria? This is about love, not just for your children, but for your own life. We were born to save the planet, and we can do it if you love this planet. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Helen Caldicott. With that, the live symposium ended, but it lives on, archived in its entirety, at totalwebcasting.com slash live slash HCF. If you'd prefer, you can just Google Caldecott and Symposium and follow the links. And of course, we will have a link up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com. Shockingly, no media covered this event. A few people from Pacifica attended, but they were not there with their sound equipment. Amy Goodman of Democracy Now! was spotted in the audience on the second day. And I wouldn't be surprised if the information she heard inspires her to put together at least one future program, if not a whole series. But there were no other cameras, microphones, or reporters there except for our own. So take a look and a listen to the materials that are posted on Dr. Caldecott's site, and then make others aware of them 
who might be interested in having this information and doing something with it. Teachers, scientists, reporters, journalists, storytellers, stand-up comedians. Boy, there's a whole daily show full of information that can be pulled out of any one of the presentations. And as we move into the token Fukushima report on the fourth anniversary, feel free to contact any reporter and any publication or broadcast outlet that has anything at all on the nuclear issue and make them aware of this symposium. Heck, make them aware of her symposium from two years ago on Fukushima as well. In this way, they will have source information for the future, and we will have a fighting chance of getting the truth out. My thanks and gratitude to Dr. Helen Caldecott and her brilliant, can't call her assistant, she's more than that, Molly Lightfoot, for putting together this astonishing event, and to all of the presenters who were there. My personal thanks from Nuclear Hot Seat to those who donated to allow me to be there and attend and bring you this report. And I gotta tell you, it was really cool meeting fans of the show, exchanging hugs, good words, even having some pictures taken. You guys, you're the best, you rock, and you're part of what makes it possible for me to even keep doing this show every week. And while I was in New York, I made it into The Daily Show with John Stewart. Into, not onto. I was an audience member on Monday, March 2nd. But hey, it's progress. No, John didn't choose me to ask him a question during his 10-minute warm-up, but it wasn't for lack of my trying. And yes, I visualized myself on the set, in front of the green screen, seated at the desk. And by the way, while I was there, I laughed my ass off. It really is a funny show. Another step on my road to being The Daily Show's nuclear pundit. Nice to be able to scout out the neighborhood before I move in. Activist shout-out. If you have not yet figured out what you're going to be doing on March 11 to mark the fourth anniversary of the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, there is a list available if you go to Facebook and put 311 Fukushima in the search bar. That will bring up 311 Fukushima fourth anniversary actions, which has a list of activities all over the world, as well as things that can be done from anywhere virtually. Please check it out and find some appropriate way to mark this very important anniversary. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Thursday, March 5, 2015. Got a little delayed with the travel time, but we got it done. Material from this week's program has been researched and compiled from Dr. Helen Caldecott, all of her marvelous presenters, as well as telegraph.co.uk, NHK, and Canadian.org. Theme music, written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.tv and is also available on airprogressive.com. Our archive is available at nuclearhotseat.com. You can also find it on iTunes, where you can subscribe under podcasts. Our YouTube channel also carries the show. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Heartistry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that life is precious and there is no planet B. So let's get busy and save this one, okay? And by the way, we've all had our nuclear wake-up call, so don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat.